Governor Bullock uh, was born in Missoula, raised in Helena. Then he left the state, deciding to go bi-coastal for his education. He has an undergraduate degree from Claremont McKenna in California. And uh, then he got his uh, law degree, Juris Doctorate degree from Columbia with honors. He came back, worked for four years with the Montana Attorney General's Office, and wrote the landmark decision which gave public access to streams and rivers, for which I have been eternally grateful. From 2000 to 2004, he practiced law with Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, D.C., and taught law at George Washington Law School. 2004, he was back to Helena to, uh, to practice law. In 2008, he was elected attorney general with more votes uh, than either of the presidential candidates. In 2012, uh, Steve Bullock was elected governor of Montana in a year in which the state was carried by uh, the Republican presidential candidate by 14 points. He won with 236,000 votes. His priorities as governor have been responsible fiscal government, job creation, better education, and a more effective government. Thus far, Montana has a budget surplus, and the state and local debt in Montana is less than 10% which is about half of the state average. So thus far, he's been very successful. And with that, Governor Bullock. Thank you so much. I might clear up at least one misconception that has nothing to do with the Stanford mailer. Um, when you said that you know, the president lost by 14 points in 2012 when I got elected and I got 236,000 votes. Made it sound like uh, it wasn't the, let's see if I can get this off. Uh, actually, I won by 7,317 votes, but who's counting? And it only took a day and a half. So it certainly was close. I, as I look out now and actually be up here, I see a couple of my old colleagues and the professors at University of Montana Law, when I hear that this is bringing together academics, lawyers, journalists, and policymakers, what could go wrong as a governor? Um, but when you talk about people and place in the rural American West, I mean, we could go so many different places here. Where you also are, in part, from what I understand from the committees, are the breakouts. No, we could spend I could spend my whole time talking about tribal policy and the tribal nations in the state of Montana, recognizing that 7% of our population, but 12% of our kids in our K-12 system, and both the challenges and the opportunities we've confronted um, as we work through sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign relationship, recognizing that we can say our unemployment rate's 4.1%, more people work than ever before in the state of Montana, on and on, but if our Native American communities aren't succeeding, there's a big piece of the overall soul and possibilities in the state of Montana that's not succeeding. We could talk about forest policy, a place that is often so contentious, but it's also a place where, from my perspective in the state of Montana, we've actually made some meaningful difference by working both on forest health and getting logs on trucks and collaboration. We could talk, of, and I will touch briefly on some of the healthcare issues. So we could really go into any different um, area for sure. Recognize what we have in a state like ours. I mean, we're a vast state of rivers, valleys, uh, from Trail Creek to certainly what are effectively the Badlands, 147,000 square miles and about a million people in it. It's funny when I go to my governor's meetings and I'm talking to the governors from Rhode Island or Vermont or others, I'm like, you're not even a county. <laughs> and think about both the challenges that presents and indeed the opportunities. Rural life is at the heart of Montana heritage. Montana has 129 incorporated cities and towns. The largest being Billings, 110,000. Smallest, Ismay, population 21. 
Vast majority of our cities have less than 1,000 people. 56 counties, eight of those 56 have 75% of the population. We're also a state that has something like 426 school districts. Talk about local control in a whole different way. As I looked in part when I took office in 2013, um, to step back a little bit, I'd asked two of our state's top business leaders, a guy named uh, Bill Johnstone, who runs D.A. Davidson, and Larry Simpkins, who runs Washington Companies, um, to put together a business plan for the state of Montana. Now, any state economic development blueprint would certainly be undertaken with a uh, considerable humility, especially for a state as large and as diverse as Montana. State economies are complex, they're significantly influenced by factors beyond our borders and control, and certainly constantly changing. Now on the one hand, we weren't starting from a clean slate. Montana has extraordinary economic resources and strengths, and that's particularly our citizens. But we also face certain weaknesses and challenges, some of which are inherent and had to be honestly acknowledged and realistically addressed. Larry and Bill uh, traveled all across our state and had eight listening sessions from the furthest corners, got input from all 56 counties, heard from over 3,000 Montanans, and using that, that's what we created, this Main Street Montana project. Through that project then, we've been going, because it's a process, ultimately, like any meaningful collaboration is a process, we're going industry by industry. We have 13 what we call key industry networks, which could be everything from agriculture to natural resources to internet connectivity um, to small businesses. Engage him probably about north of 200 CEOs um, in this process now. And each group is really saying, where are our strengths? Where are our weaknesses? Where are our obstacles to growth? Where's government stand in the way? And where are those opportunities? Uh, I'd like to talk about some of those issues uh, that they're currently um, discussing, talking about how it's especially pertinent to rural Montana. It's hard to imagine our state, certainly without agriculture. It's part of what makes Montana the last best place. It's our rolling rangeland, our fields, grain, all under the big sky. Whether we live in the cities or the rural areas, ag is certainly essential to the economic survival of our state. Um, and it's important for all of us to understand that connection. We're now the number one pea and lentil producer, indeed, in the entire United States. Some of the best beef cattle took uh, the, I guess, executive vice president of stock growers to Taiwan and South Korea last year and speaking about, because Montana is certainly a place, but it's also, in some respects, almost an identifiable brand. The excitement that they had if we could ever get that real sort of chain and that line of just Montana sourced beef and what a premium it would sell because of what people think of this wonderful place that we live. Wheat, so much of our grain going to um, the uh, Asian countries. Incredible opportunities for our state, but by the same token, the average age of our farmer, our producer, is nearly 60 years old. And think about, as we look to that next generation, ensuring what are we doing to try to make sure that that next generation actually has more opportunity to stay on the ranch, or farm, if indeed they want to, and how do we make sure that that is a vital and viable thing for an individual to do? And how do we make sure that those communities stay vital and viable? I was talking to a guy named Lance Trebish uh, last week. He has a company in Harleton, Montana, called Ticket River Printing. This could be next year campus. I mean, it is a tech company. But he said, this is where I want to do this. So how can we preserve our ag communities, but also make sure that there's the vitality to keep that community strong as 
and to keep those schools filled as people want to do other things as well. Ag is certainly a part of everything we do, from the food we eat to the clothes we wear to the wide open spaces that we enjoy underneath the big sky, which brings me, I guess, the next transition point is uh, what we have beyond our city boundaries, and in some respects, here, it's not even beyond the city boundaries. It's out your parking lot. You know, I think of growing up here, I didn't really grow up in Missoula. I moved to Helena when I was four. Um, but a lot of my memories that I had as a child and a lot of the things that I'm now instilling in our 13, 11, and 9-year-old, it's not about money. It's not about it's chasing my older brother up and down mountains and going fishing and enjoying the value of these incredible natural resources that we have here. Natural resources in as much as our mountains are clean air, our clean water, the ability to camp, hike, hunt, fish. What actually got me into wanting to run for office, sometimes I rue that day, but um, was when I was a baby lawyer at the Attorney General's office and there was a group that was suing on our stream access laws. And I was in federal court and said, you know, my name's Steve Bullock. I represent the people of Montana. And no matter how large our checkbooks, our wallets are, the streams and the rivers belong to each and every one of us. And how essential that is as we go forward. And how we also have significant tension in many of the western states um, about the value of those public lands. And then should they ultimately be... Uh, taken back, or indeed, from my perspective, what would happen is privatized. And I think there's significant both cultural and economic value. I mean, we're a state of a million people. We have over 11 million visitors each year. Economic impact, $4 billion. They're not coming for our Walmarts. And I was actually with a Walmart representative and said, N -n like, no offense. I mean, they're coming to enjoy what we have here. Taking it back, though, to then the third one, so that going back to my Main Street Montana project, one of the, they came up with five pillars initially before we started going industry by industry. And one of them was to build upon Montana's economic foundation. Now, we're known as the treasure state for good reason. We provide resources that provide energy and wealth. We help feed the nation, the world. We have incredible opportunities, outdoor opportunities, to offer both residents and visitors. But while we are gathering this information on the Main Street program, um, you could be in Miles City, which is in eastern Montana. For those of you not from Montana, they say Billings is Eastern Montana, no, you've got a long way further to go there. Um, but you could be in Mile City or Missoula, and quality of life was named as the most important strength for our economic development in this state. Now, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's clear that Montanans cherish our outdoor heritage. They cherish recognizing that that's what attracts people to Montana. That's what wants, uh, they want to stay here. They also noted our state's infrastructure challenges. We heard about pressing transportation and communications needs that must be met to enable Montana-made and Montana-grown products to reach national and indeed international markets. Our natural resources and quality of life present incredible boost both of them, to residents and businesses in every one of those 56 counties. And we have to capitalize on those assets in a way that recognizes the tension and doesn't always resolve it, but figures out the way to be responsible on the path going forward. Another aspect, I guess, of being a state um, as large as ours is our lawmakers have lots of, shall I say, diverse viewpoints. Sometimes it can be difficult to um, 
agree on what sound public policy might look like. Now, I guess that's, we're not unique in that respect um, in as much as Looking around the country, I think, by and large, we are a much more functional state. And that's not trashing all the dysfunctional states. Um, than a lot of places. And somehow we figure out ways to work forward and recognize that uh, it's not all about political wins and losses. And we're a state that has a citizen legislature so it meets 90 days every two years as interim committees. 100 in the House, 50 in the Senate. But I'll give two examples of legislation that would or could have significant impacts on rural Montana and how either moved forward or didn't. First is Medicaid expansion. Montana's been the only state, and just as background, my legislature's 60% Republican. Uh, Montana's the only state in the last two years to have brought our federal taxpayer dollars home, expand Medicaid, and we figured out a way to do it in a way that really was a bipartisan compromise and approach. And it, there was nothing easy about accomplishing that task. The journey was full of twists, turns, but ultimately as a bipartisan group of legislators that said doing nothing isn't an option here. And you could be a very conservative, conservative legislator from a small town recognizing that if I lose that hospital, I've lost that community. Never forget it was in town, uh, Shoto. Uh, now I forget the exact number, but I think it was 70%. And if there's any journalist don't quote me on this, I say. Tracy, do you remember? What's that? Yeah. 73% of everybody that walked through that hospital door did not have insurance. 73%. You know, I could certainly look through that room and say, you know, I'm not a betting man, but not even the 27% voted for me. But everybody gathered and said, if we lose this hospital, We've lost this community. The recognition of people needed to come together to bring our taxpayer dollars home, but also provide health care for individuals. First week that Montanans were allowed to sign up, 6,000 signed up. To date, total enrollment is north of 36,000. 36,000 Montanans that now have access to quality health care. It's 36,000 Montanans that actually now, instead of the cost shifting that occurs with healthcare, where people wait until they're the sickest as possible, go to the emergency room where the costs are highest, and those costs are shifted to everybody else, it's 36,000 Montanans that now have the opportunity to do preventative care. And because we had to do it unique in a Montana way, it's also 36,000 folks, other than the real medically frail, where we're tying them into our job services and saying, in a welcoming manner, not a punitive manner, how can we address some of the challenges in your life to make it so that you can fulfill every opportunity that you might want? We visited uh, many of those rural hospitals around the state, and the benefit to them is incredible. As I said before, you can't have that, that many diverse folks participate um, without also having bumps in the road. So I'd be like lying if I came and said everything is successful and then dropped the mic and left. Um, so let's talk about disappointments. Most notable was probably infrastructure. State of 147,000 square miles, this many communities are going to have significant, significant infrastructure needs. And there can always be discussion, where does the payment for those best lie? Is it with the local rate payers? Should the state, because we're trying to have a completely vital and viable communities all across the state, play some role? Should we pit east versus west, north versus south? Does the state have an obligation to try to make sure that 
their local schools, even if it's a local school, local control state that has working fire escapes and things like that. Um, recognizing that these needs are going to be there and only compounding, and look, Montana's not entirely unique by any means, you know, American Society of Civil Engineers, I think the average infrastructure grade across the nation was about a C. But we came in with a significant bill. Significant bill that actually tried to tie the whole state together. Say so you might be in Beaverhead County, which is south, uh, southwestern Montana, or you might be in Richland County, which is the northeast, but you all have infrastructure needs. And in a rural state, we can't pit one another can't pit ourselves against one another, be that geographically or urban versus rural. I thought I had the greatest idea in the world. Let's actually look at this as all one big infrastructure challenge. Recognize that I might have been the only one that thought that was a great idea. Legislature hated it, or at least the majority party did. So we said, all right, let's go back to the drawing board and took another legislator, a guy named John Brendan, he's former chair of the Republican Party, he came up with a bill. And it was a compromise bill, we worked on it, spent about half of what I'd proposed on infrastructure. And um, passed the Senate 47 to three. On the House side, failed by a vote. And the Speaker of the House at the time then, on that last day, said, you know, when you have a conservative caucus that felt like they lost everything, literally everything this session, this is the only way they could walk out of this session with a win. And I think a state as large as ours, and as you talk about rural versus urban and others, we've got to recognize the wins and losses don't happen at the State House. Because it's not all about, this wasn't a win for Montana, it wasn't a win for eastern Montana, which is more impacted from oil and gas development than anywhere else in the state. Wasn't a win for the businesses striving and at times struggling because of the lack of infrastructure or the businesses that would have been investing in building out this infrastructure over the long term. We need to continue to work on certainly solutions to infrastructure challenges our state faces press forward to build on those states' economic strength, and also with the diversity of our state, the political diversity, the geographic diversity, continue to find ways to um, really bring us together. Our rural, rural heritage will always be a big factor when we look at the growth of our overall state. I mean, there's job opportunities in this place, like many others that I couldn't have imagined growing up, um, certainly didn't exist a generation ago, with increasing education, healthcare, construction, technology, business, and professional services careers, other areas, like we are continuing to grow and diversify. And because of those opportunities, more Montanans will have that chance to both live in a place that they love and earn a good living. Um, in a place that they love. And I think we'll continue to both work. It was, uh, I often tell this story, uh, you know, as governor, you get to meet some unique people. And I met Elon Musk. I'm like, I often ask people, okay, you know, if you're governor, what's the first thing you do? And Mr. Musk said, well, I'd go out and tell all my subjects, and I'm like, okay, they're not actually subjects. Um, all right. Well, I'd go out and tell all my people to have more babies. I'm like, what? And it might have been he has like triplets and twins who are all under five. His point was, in a state of 147,000 square miles and a million people, you are going to have some challenges with economic growth and diversification just because of the population. And you grow a burgeoning tech center in Missoula in part because, or biotech 
in part because the individual in the company that comes here says, if this doesn't work out, I can go somewhere else. But absent that huge population in a state like ours, we have to work a little bit harder. And that's why on the private sector, public are partners that much better with the university system. Partners with state government to say, we can be more responsive and nimble and meet some of these needs as we move forward by actually coming together and recognizing the opportunities and recognizing the private sector can't do it alone, education system can't do it alone, um, and at times that government can help facilitate that. And then we also, though, need to figure out ways to build forward to ensure that sort of the values that want to drive people to stay in a place like this um, and to be part of it are consistent and constant. Values like equal pay for equal work, our investment certainly in infrastructure, our public education, our fair and transparent elections, our public access, those lands, rivers, and streams, access and affordable access for care for our most vulnerable that makes overall a part of a population. I think those are things that as we look at what an opportunity for the state is, really has to be a part of it. So thanks um, to you for both bringing this conference to Montana. Thank you for the meaningful conversations that you're having about life in the rural areas in the West and how it can both be improved. Thanks for the collaboration of diversity um, as you're part of these conversations. And I guess I would be willing to answer at least questions I'd be interested in answering. <laughs> Thanks, though, for having me, for sure. <laughs> questions? Oh, good. It's not working. I can run. Yeah. Uh, this may be a question you don't want to answer, but I'll I'm sure it will be. Thank you, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> you you talked about how um, the Montanans really value the uh, beauty and the environment here, uh, and Chris earlier mentioned the fact that in Glacier Park, the glaciers are disappearing and possibly it'll be called Glaciated Park, was his joke, but uh, the question I have is that uh, the clean power plan, the, uh, the government's efforts to sure. try to uh, get greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere in order to reduce global warming and harm, sure. uh, it seems looking at the data that you you're dealing with a state that's very a much of two minds. So talk a little bit about how you deal with it, given that you've got, as I said, a state divided of two minds. Yeah, I, uh, I enter into that with the uh, great, I guess, uh, disadvantage of <laughs> not seeing the data, but a little bit about where, I mean, from my perspective, our climate's changing. Our farmers see it. Our sportsmen and women see it. And, you know, it doesn't take a scientist for us to figure that out because we're outdoors people. To the first piece of when the initial clean power plan came out, it certainly, we have 28% of uh, our nation's coal reserves. We have 8% of the world's coal reserves. We have uh, second largest coal-fired power generating plant west of the Mississippi River. When it first came out, uh, the draft guidelines, actually we brought together from conservationists to utility owners to others, said, can we meet this? And how would we go about it? Had listening sessions around the state, we proposed a plan, saying this, just a conceptual plan, this may not be the be all and end all, but it is um, something that at least shows that 
we have a can-do attitude and we can figure out a path. Now, the final rule came out and Montana actually had the highest, that was 47 percent, uh, mass reductions or reductions in the nation. And I did say this is chronically unfair to the state of Montana um, because we're also a power exporter. We provide, uh, I mean, we have incredible wind resources. We have geothermal resources that aren't fully tapped into. We have hydro, um, and we power many other places beyond our state's borders. Um, but said certainly that it was unfair and that I supported the litigation going forward. But again, the answer isn't, and I think this is bigger than just in this diversity. The answer can't, if you're a governor, the answer isn't just to, you know, with all due respect to any of you that serve in the U.S. Senate, I mean, I think at times now, folks just want to yell at one another. I mean, we actually have to get things done. So we were in the process, we put together Clean Power Plan Advisory Council, and it had those same stakeholders and said, all right, now we got to really roll up our sleeves and figure out how to do this when this thing was stayed. How do you go forward and how do you move forward? I think that it comes with a couple different premises, one of which is that um, certainly climate change is real. Another is that our energy future is going to look different than today. I mean, it scratches my head, I'm, or I scratch my head in as much as that there's been more technological changes in my phone, probably even in the last five years, than there has in how we generate energy from carbon products, especially coal, in the last 40. And we have that can-do attitude. We know this is going to be a consistent, reliable source, potentially. Why is it that we have to go to, I went to Saskatchewan, it's called the Sask Power Boundary Dam Project. I mean, they actually did a CO2 capture where it's being used for enhanced oil recovery, and their CO2 stream ended up 97% pure. I mean, you could make pop out of it. Why is it that they're the ones that are leading when we ought to have that ingenuity? I guess that's a long way to go from my perspective that Things are going to look different, and it's not going to happen overnight, but we have to be methodical and just as in forest practices, forestry practices. If you want to be on just both the polemic sides, we're not ever going to get anything done. But if we're going to get people around a round table and say, how can we move this forward? I mean, I have great confidence that we will. We will address climate change. And we will also change the way that we utilize um, some of our fossil fuels. But I also think that, you know, everybody for all of the railing about the clean power plant, and <laughs> I was one that railed at times too. I mean, even at the end of it, it went from 40% to 30% of energy production in our nation by coal. It's going to be part of our energy future. Afternoon, Governor. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Monty Mills. I just joined the faculty of the law school here in Indian Law. And I would venture to say there are few governors, particularly in the West, who would begin a speech in a room where there are no tribal leaders talking about tribal law and policy. And I would venture further to say there are even fewer who would talk about a sovereign to sovereign relationship between the state and tribe. So I wondered if, particularly in light of the unique federal tribal relationship, you would talk about your view of the state's role in dealing with tribal sovereignty and with the tribal nations here in Montana? Sure. Um, and I guess, like, I, I could give the background. So I was Attorney General, State's Chief Lawyer, and Chief Law Enforcement Officer before becoming uh, governor. And in Montana, all law enforcement functions are consolidated under the Attorney General. There's no, like, Bureau of Public Safety and things. And recognizing, be it prescription drug abuse or other challenges that wherever, <laughs> A parent in Indian country has the same concerns about as I do with my kids in Helen in some respects, meaning that we want to keep them safe. We want to make sure that they're doing the best they can. So we actually, when I was Attorney General, started sort of 
sovereign to sovereign discussions and to figure out where we could build bridges. Now, Montana has uh, eight tribal nations. Um, seven of them are federally recognized. If you walk into, it's called the governor's reception room. It's this beautiful paneled you know, room and things like that. There are the flags of our tribal nations right next to the U.S. and the uh, Montana flag. When I talk about the Main Street Montana project, we had a whole different piece of that was just about the Main Street Project, economic development in Indian country. We have seven tribal colleges, more tribal colleges than any other state in the nation. Yet, in coming in, those tribal colleges had never actually had meetings or appeared before our Board of Regents that runs the rest of the higher ed programs. Um, it's a critical part of both the cultural but economic facets of our state. And we've seen some advances. I mean, we've seen where, as we look at statewide economic development growth models, where we're bringing our two-year colleges in for training, um, we're also bringing in the tribal colleges. Looked at, I think, the first of its kind, uh, the tribal LLC bill last year, so we can get over the challenges of sovereignty, you know, making sure that investors will be more comfortable um, investing because in some respects the tribe's giving up a little bit of its sovereignty to go in the marketplace, but a bill that's just based on that. Recognizing that you have significant economic challenges um, with getting access to capital, like we created a half million dollar fund that's just a revolving fund to help secure some of the capital for tribal-based businesses. Um, I'd say a list of some of the things that we've done and do, but also recognizing that it's, I mean, people could come to Montana and say, well, there's not a lot of diversity here. And it's incredible diversity. And you can't even kind of monolithically say, well, these are all of our tribal, you know, well, you have non-Indian and Indians because study your history. Crow Northern Cheyenne were actually killing one another during Custer's battles. So there's often differences and disparities um, in many different ways. But I think in Montana we are both recognizing the cultural importance, the educational importance. I mean, Montana has in our state constitution, though it didn't even start really go until a handful of years ago, Indian education for all. So my fifth grader knows more about our Indian cultures than I probably did when I graduated from high school uh, here in Montana. But we're actually building a lot of those economic bridges. It's not without some challenges. Not everybody likes that idea. Um, but I'd like to think that we are making some headways while also recognizing a sovereign-to-sovereign -sovereign relationship. So and this will be our last question. Phew. Just kidding. <laughs> I'll go easy on you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Marty Blair. I'm at the University of Montana. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a, a figure of uh, the average age, I think, of, of farmers, ranchers, about 60 years of age, which means our rural and remote areas, obviously, they're getting older. And that will continue to happen. And, yeah. and uh, our aging population isn't because people are moving here. It's because people are staying here. Can you talk at all about economic development issues for more rural and remote parts of the state and what we might be doing to vitalize or revitalize these places where the population is getting older, maybe more needy in terms of social services? And yeah, I, I mean, one thing I can look at, I mean, from that, from the social infrastructure, I mean, I, I can look over the next 10 years and know that um, we need 1,300 new jobs in healthcare each and every year. And recognizing then this is where I think the state is doing a better job partnering with the private sector and our educational system to say, we gotta figure out a way to meet that pipeline. And that's either expanding the programs or that's apprenticeships. I mean, it could be a phlebotomist apprentice, which we have them up at, uh, Marcus Daly Hospital, 
We've also been investing some more money into trying to keep people in their homes because that's a piece of it and also saves on health care costs. But we, as a state, at least as a state being higher ed, my office, and the private sector, have really been saying, like, that is a big piece, and we've got to come together to make that pipeline or you're going to lose your rural communities. Uh, was the first governor to expand Whammy, Washington, you know, the residency program where Montana students can go because we need more docs in this state. And we've got to figure out the ways to do it. Because we know that if, if you're Riverstone Health and Billings, which has a residency program, like 85% of them stay in our state. Keeping the vitality of a uh, rural community. I mean, one area that I've been doing some work on is internet connectivity in our smaller communities, but doing it through the schools, because I can get about 80% of the money from the feds if I'm doing it at school. But once you've run that fiber into that school, then the businesses will have the opportunity to draw from it. And that's why that Ticket River, it's called Lance Trebish, is in Harlowtown, Montana, which has well, got to be a population 1,100. Um, so I think we look at it in that way from a healthcare perspective. I think that it's not without some challenge, especially with the grain of not just, as you said, the ag producers, but the entire state, uh, but trying to make those connections between urban and rural and trying to make it so that the opportunities afforded a student. Like we've made, it's housed here at this campus, made significant investments in the digital academy, which is online learning that a local school district doesn't have to pay for but you want to make sure that if a kid wants to learn Mandarin Chi Chinese and you're in Geyser, Montana, that has a high school of probably 35, that you have that same opportunity as Helena High of 1300. We also look, and then I'll drop this, um, I mean, through that Main Street project, um, on the ag side, what the producers were saying, and I think it's really true, is how do we keep more of the food dollar here? You could go down the hall here at, uh, in this very building and you have so much locally sourced food that you serve here. I could go to the Flathead area, Kalispell, and their high schools have locally sourced food we started as an AmeriCorps VISTA program. It's now starting to go across the nation, but it started in Montana Food Corps to try to get people to actually, you know, grow and source local. State level, we have food and ag development centers to try to actually people can bring in their product and market our pr produce and prepare it right there to sell it locally. And uh, there's some, been some discussion about, yeah, how, how do you actually do more beef processing in a place like ours. But the more of the food dollar that we can keep here, I think will also help the vitality of our rural communities that are so ag and land based because then the millennial will say, boy, I could make a good living and I could live in this place that I love. Thanks again for grappling with many of the challenging issues that certainly I face on a daily basis and that you're all intimately involved in and aware of. Thanks for having me. Thank <laughs> you.